could you could you start? <clears throat> yes, um, we were thinking or we planning this show, and um, how did it came? We um, yeah, we talked a lot about my uh, experiences and my new works because I painted before very kind of differently, uh, very colorful, but also with kind of figures in it. And um, yeah, it had all a more, let's say, pessimistic touch, but also funny, but yeah, very different. And um, we wanted to, yeah, and you came up with Zdenek, who did, I didn't know, and I heard his story, and that he also went through a deep, deeper, more or less to say, than my transition. But, and yeah, how, these coincidences in life, um, how, how, how interesting they are, how these things come together and, and make a very nice show. Um, yeah, so the so. meaning of the transition means that something changed. And uh, the reason why I made this workshop is that uh, I wanted to speak about the changes of uh, ourselves, because when we get born, we are, uh, it's called a tabula rasa. Yeah, we have no memories, uh, most of us. Some people believe that we lived uh, in previous mm, lives. That's extremely problematic philosophically, but I will. Exactly, well. <laughs> exactly. That's why we have you. Yeah. And, uh, I could uh, give. So this kind of transition when we are growing up and uh, we are becoming adults, uh, grown-ups, uh, we start our careers and then we are developing our, uh, they are developing our, as an artist and uh, then I also developed. Uh, I was an entrepreneur, then I sold everything. Uh, I nearly died uh, because of uh, uh, pancreas disease and uh, I became gallerist by accident. And uh, the gallery moved from one to another place and uh, we developed a, a quite amazing uh, structure, which is interesting. And so uh, all of us are uh, passing some transitions. Many of you uh, no, all of you are passing the same processes. So uh, I was very happy to see what kind of transition happened to Uwe and also Zdenek. His story is super interesting and we will, he will speak about it. By the way, Zdenek, you mentioned that uh, your English is not that good. Yeah. You are free to speak Czech and I will okay. translate. Maybe yeah. I can try my best and you yes. can help me. Yes, or we have other uh, English speakers who understand Czech, so they can help. Okay. Yeah. So now, uh, because you as a photographer, you passed uh, through quite interesting story. Could you could you tell it? Uh, could you say that in short? Okay. Maybe I can uh, speak Czech. It's better for to explain everything what I have uh, in my mind and in my heart. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, vlastně k fotografii jsem se dostal někdy uh, na konci 80. let uh, jako k mému velkému koníčku a vášní pro sebe vyjádření. OK, so he became a photographer at the end of 80s and uh, uh, the reason why he became a photographer was that uh, he was passionate about self-expression. He wanted to express himself. Ve svém mládí jsem maloval. He painted when he was young. Ale potom jsem štětce a pastelky opustil na dlouhou dobu. And he stopped doing that for a long time. Ale dal jsem sebe vyjádření nebo respektive naplnění svého života v jiných oblastech. Co to bylo? <laughs> Závody v motorkách třeba. Ah, okay. Jsem motocross. Okay. So he, he was also a motor, motocross, uh, a bike, bike uh, ra racer and uh, so yeah. That's very shortly. I will not translate everything, so we don't waste today our times too much. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he was accepted uh, uh, to FAMU, what is uh, the <coughs> Academy of uh, uh, Arts. But uh, how do you translate FAMU? Academy for Performing Arts. Yes, A Academy of Performing Fam Arts. Yes. Fam 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 so it's a film and television school. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. So exactly. Yes. You also come from there? Yes. Yes. Could you introduce yourself? <coughs> oh, uh, my name is Peter. Yes. Uh, I, 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 I teach an art history course. Um, right next door. Yes. That's Good. Super. Thank you, thank uh, you for <laughs> that. Because uh, I, I just uh, I asked you so, so straight. Uh, just, to, just to know uh, 
where, where you are and to, of course I would like to in include all of you in this discussion. Yeah? I don't want to just uh, my monologue or Mark, Mark would be able to speak a whole, uh, whole day. Yeah? It's no problem for him. But uh, it would be lovely because it's a workshop to include uh, include you and also maybe you you, you have uh, something to say about your transition which uh, maybe might be interesting. But uh, let's continue. Mm -hmm. to rychle jenom. Vlastně dva roky předtím, když jsem se přihlásil na FAMU, tak jsem se seznámil s klukama z Bratrstva. OK, so he became a founding member of the Brotherhood, uh, what is quite interesting uh, group of photographers and uh, his theoreticians, historians and so on, uh, as I described um, or mentioned before. And this happened two years before he was accepted to the academy. Mm -hmm. uh v té době na tu školu opravdu byl přísný výběr a brali málo lidí a asi to díky... Co? No, že to berou pořád málo. A asi vlastně díky té uh, práci v tom městském združení jsem se tam dostal na poprvé, což bylo v té době docela výjimečný. Mm -hmm. OK, so he was accepted uh, to the academy for uh, at, at the first uh, attempt. What is uh, in that time he mentioned it was unusual, but it is unusual until these days. <laughs> Já to jenom říkám kvůli tomu, že tam vznikaly takové vtipné situace, jako že tím, že něco jsme už předtím udělali s tím bratrstvem, tak třeba v první nebo druhém ročníku jsem se učil u nás už v té škole, že to bylo vtipné. Ah, so during the first uh, or second year of his studies, he already well, he, he during during the studies uh, an information or or a, a part of the lecture about the brotherhood group became or in that time a part of the class uh, of the topics in the class so it was interesting that he studied uh, the academy and uh, one of the topics already was him not only me of course yes. uh, uh... Říkám to jenom proto, že vlastně potom ty události nabrali rychlej spát a já už jsem vlastně v druhém ročníku na FAMU s přáteli založil ateliér reklamní fotografie a velice rychle jsme vyrostli jako profesně v té komerční. During the second year of his studies he established a commercial atelier for, for advertise, for commercial photography and they became very successful quite quickly. Also, I, if I may, I will make some point because uh, this uh, this time after the Velvet Revolution was uh, a time of another transition of our country. We moved from the communism to democracy, and uh, there was a very interesting time period of five, maybe seven years. Uh, the historians might have uh, more details about it than I have, where when uh, almost anything was possible in this country. And uh, when you when you started doing something, there was nobody else. There was a lot of competition, so uh, it was quite easy to become popular, successful, and uh, the new uh, generation of uh, future uh, leaders were formed in that time. Yeah, so it was a really interesting time. Honestly, I was nine years old in that time in 1989, and for me, that time was. Uh, after the revolution, the, the, the air in the society changed and we all breathed so easily and we were so enthusiastic and so, so, so fulfilled by this sense of freedom and happiness and that time was great, yeah? So he was there during the time. No, I just wanted to tell you that it was a fact that it was not easy. Čím víc jsem se věnoval té komerční práci, tím to ve mně víc ubíjelo ten tvůrčí kreativní potenciál v té volné tvorbě. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the more involved in the commercial photography he was, uh, the less he, he produced a free photography or art photography. And uh, he moved from the art photographer to the commercial photographer. Takže vlastně úplně se změnilo to, proč jsem začal fotografovat a vlastně se to stalo pro mě jenom vydělávání finančních prostředků a jako bych vnitřně jim dělal jako vnice. So the reason why he took photograph, uh, where, why he took images changed from that uh, freedom of expression and happiness as an artist, uh, he was uh, forced or he decided to take money for and to, to make it uh, and, and work for his living. So 
he mentioned that uh, the, uh, the spirit uh, was uh, suffered uh, during that time and he became a pure commercial photographer. Uh, jedno dnes jsem si řekl už dost a vlastně na vrchu kariéry jsem den ze dne opustil, uh, opustil vlastně jako prostředí ty komerční fotografie a ustěval jsem se na méně. Uh, this, was, this was too short. <laughs> <laughs> Co mezi tím ještě mám říct? And that was far more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> ne, prostě jsem se dostal do mezi lidí, jako byli největší biznesmeni tady v tom státě, politici, pro nich jsem do zákulisí všech těch věcí, jak tady vznikají, jak tam lidi tahali prostě za kličky, potkal jsem se s lidmi, jako je Kellner, současný prezident, politici z ČSSD, mega biznesmeni a úplně, úplně jsem je kasol, jako tady, jako, a chlupy se mi ježí, jak mi nepříjemně, nechtěl bych už to nikdy být v tom prostředí, protože není o co stát. Okay, so uh, Zdeněk mentioned that during his uh, commercial photographer career, he met uh, interesting people like Peter Kellner, who passed uh, uh, more than a year ago, who was the father of PPF and one of the richest persons of this country, uh, the actual president, and many other, uh, let's say, VIPs or politicians or um, influential people. And he mentioned that uh, these meetings were not very nice for him and that he didn't like it. So he decided to, to leave the commercial photography and uh, change his lifestyle. But you are still not mentioning the interesting point, which <laughs> many people are waiting for. Uh, and that's your drug experience. No, tak je, to, co můžu zmínit ještě, je, že vlastně já, já jsem kopal velice dobře. Tu profesi jsem odváděl opravdu na dobrý úrovni. V té době nás tady bylo třeba, nevím, šest, šest fotografů, který se točili v těch tendrech, takže opravdu jsem byl úplně na tom, na tom nejvyšším levelu. Ale vlastně jsem pochopil, že kopu dobře, ale za špatný tým, že propadl svoji prací třeba věci, které jsem potom pochopil, že pro ty lidi nejsou dobrý, a začal jsem si uvědomovat vlastně dopady své práce, že ta práce má nějaký vliv na, na že vlastně se spolu vytvářím to vědomí té společnosti. He just mentioned that uh, he became of a part through his work. He became a part of the uh, <coughs> consciousness of the society. We could translate. Maybe you have better translation than I. Uh, those of you who understand, uh, because uh, he felt a kind of uh, a, a, he had a bad feelings from the from what happened around him through the people he met. And also he mentioned that uh, he became a part of the groups which were not uh, making him a better person, but that was the direct opposite. And also, ale ty si nezmínil, pořád si nezmínil svoje drogové zážitky, které ty k tomu patří. A já na mě čekám. OK, dobře, tak to vypalím. Samozřejmě, když jste úspěšný a vlastně máte ten takový high size society mezi těma, těma lidma, tak to je vlastně jeden nekonečný větší, tak se dopracuje a jde se prostě do barů, do, se chodil v té době do veřejných domů a nekonečný prostě party do rána, blue light a další bary. A takhle si v tom jdete prostě x let a úplně už si říkáte, že jako musíte skončit a buď s tím, jak žijete, a nebo skončíte jako tady v pobytu na této tý planetě. Takže to byl jeden z dalších důvodů, proč jsem toho zanechal. Pardon, já jenom dělám vsuvku. Marceli, můžeš zkontrolovat, že tam běží ten záznam? Že to, jen, že to jede? To bylo Jo, měl by tam přibývat na Jo. jo. Dobrý. Děkuji. Uh, ahoj, Leone. Vítám tě. Uh, jsem rád, že jsi dělal krát. So, uh, the drug experience, I know the details, yeah. I, will, I will say it in English, because this is, for me, as I understand, that was quite important moment in his life. So, uh, during his uh, commercial photographic career, he became a part of the high society, he, he partied a lot, and uh, on those parties there were a lot of drugs, and. Uh, Uh, of course, they, they tried everything what was available, and during one of uh, during one of his uh, these parties, something bad happened. So, mm. 
během jedné z těch party, kdy jste to přehnali s, tím, s těmi nějakými látkami? Uh... <laughs> to byl velice silný zážitek. Já jsem teda nejel v nějakých jako tvrdých drogách, ale hodně jsme kouřili uh, trávu a skank a tyhle ty věci. A jednou se nám podařilo na nějaký večírku to kombinovat s alkoholem a uh, mělo to na mě takový vliv, že jsem upadl do hodinového pekla, kde jsem se odčel úplně do jiných dimenzí bytí a vlastně jsem zjistil, jak je to hrozný tady v tom stavu jakoby bejt a spustilo mi to uh, panický ataky. Vlastně to byl impuls k tomu, aby se mi tam odeřely ve mně nějaké jakoby temné věci a uh, skrze tenhle ten spouštěč uh, se rozděl ve mně proces nějakého nějaký sebedestrukce v zájmu zachování mý bytosti a, a její asi znovu zrození tehdy tam jakoby začalo. Mm -hmm. OK, so... Uh, long story short, uh, the, the, the reason or the impact of the, of the drugs uh, which they took at one party in combination with alcohol uh, was that he ended up in the hospital with a heartbeat over 200, they couldn't stop it, they used the defibrillator to, uh, to stop his heart. And this, uh, this kind of experience was the beginning of his transition, the, the transformation process. He uh, became a different person and he decided to leave the commercial, the commercial photography and he decided to leave the society at all. And he really moved to the forests where he lived for 15 years. And uh, during that time, uh, many things happened. What happened? <coughs> Mm. I know it because I made a long interview with him and the interview is a part of the catalog which is already printed so you will get it so you can read it but it's a super interesting story yeah that's why we are getting a short story long yes exactly yeah, yeah maybe uh, yeah. We, maybe we can do an opposite <laughs> so tak já to skrátím tak vlastně to období pro mě znamenalo uh, Poznání, že tohle ten svět není jenom ten materiální, ale i ten duchovní, takový to nehmatatelný. E, začal jsem chápat trošku zákony jakoby, e, karmy ve smyslu jakoby, nějakých e, činů a důsledků těch činů. E, začaly se mi tam čistit nějaký podvědomý programy z dětství, který jsem neměl ve své podstatě lehký, co se týče jakoby, ze strany rodiny. A vlastně jsem procházel takovouhle dlouhou uh, transformací, uh, abych se mohl vlastně jakoby nějakým způsobem poskládat dohromady v trošku jiný podobě, než jsem byl tehdy. OK, so uh, during this transformation process, when he left and lived in the forest, uh, he realized what is the karma, what does it mean? And also he realized that uh, there were some bad Uh, memories uh, or bad experiences uh, from his family. Uh, he had to he had to get rid of it them, or he had to let them go. And this this kind of uh, uh, the process of transformation, which involved uh, the meditation and also uh, this kind of let's say new knowledge, which was for him new. Uh, It helped him to to become a different person, and uh, mm, he did quite a lot of quite a lot of interesting things to, in the forest, uh, where he mentioned or he created some groups of people who decided to live in a different way. But uh, that's another part of the story. <coughs> yeah. But uh, Zdenek, uh, I would like to terminate uh, your inter interaction now because. Uh, We, the topics which will come uh, in your life yeah, will continue through the, through the other speakers. Now, Mark. Okay, well, do you yes. want me to talk about transition? Yes, and okay. uh, also introduce, uh, just say about your story. Yeah, oh my your God. Your story is ex extremely interesting. Well, um, how can I say? I was a policeman for four years. I was a diplomat for six months. I sold rugs and tapestries to fascist dictators in Central America, living in New York for a number of years. I then had a moral crisis because I made so much money. I lived in a tax haven called Jersey. 
I had a crisis, so I gave my house and all everything I owned away, became a hippie in India, and I met a shoved up piece of old baggage in the street of Calcutta called Mother Teresa, and came back and became a Franciscan friar for five years, and then gave that up in order, when I left religious life, I went to the Court Old Institute, where I did a further degree I already had from my prior, prior days, degrees in philosophy and theology, and I did degrees in art history, including a doctorate. There you are, my life, bingo. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, he, he really made a long story short. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have many adventures in all those chapters, but I think we should talk about transition. Yeah. Uh, the word, of course, when I heard that this was the title for the exhibition, took me straight towards the, what the meaning of transition is, which comes from the verb to transit, which means to pass across, to go across. And as I wrote the catalogue essay for um, Uwe's work, I wanted to pick up on this theme of passing across, because what is central to all his work from the very beginning you know, and I'm talking from 20 years ago now, 2002 onwards, is an interest in passage. Of course, passing across is a form of passage. Transiting is passaging. And his, uh, because he'd studied a, a background in relation to anthropology, there is a sort of consonant influence that ran through his work. And there are certain books, <coughs> certain phenomena that are repeated again and again. And, of course, Fraser's Golden Bough, which everyone probably read, was the very late 19th century, uh, when anthropology began as a discipline, began to look at the synthesis between myth, religion, and you know, anthropology, which is of the life of man, the study of the life of man, uh, the synthesis and the shared histories, the shared narratives that occur across all civilizations and all periods. And one of the most crucial influences was this book, by Joseph Campbell, who was a very influential figure in the 19th century, called a theory with a called a hero with a thousand faces. And Campbell uh, spent his whole life, he lived to be nearly 90, in his 80s, I think he died, um, synthesizing all the, the mythological narratives with religious narratives and with anthropological narratives to create, a, as it were, a sort of picture of human origin. And uh, within that picture of human origin, he concentrated primarily on one narrative that exists for all of us, the narrative of journey. Life is a journey, um, and how you handle that journey determines the quality and the value of the life you live and uh, the direction you direct your life towards. So this notion of the journey became a very important theme in his work. And so transition then also implies, because it implies passage, it implies rites of passage. There are certain moments in our life that are transitional in which we change uh, specifically. You can see my life has had quite a few changes, <laughs> all those slots. And so the notion of uh, the passage is, is integral to um, his work. The present series of works in this exhibition are a discrete series. So in my essay, I didn't actually concentrate very much on this narrative, which of course runs through all the other publications. There are many publications on Uwe's work. It runs this notion of the narrative of the journey. I concentrated in this context within uh, on the notion of colour, but maybe I'll come back to that later, why yes, I concentrated yes. on colour. That will be another, the whole part of the workshop will be about colour. Yeah, so I concentrated on colour because colour is a, has a particularly uh, a vivid meaning in his work. It sets the tone for the uh, comprehension of his work. And so uh, that is the immediate thoughts I have about transition, passage, change, transiting, moving across, life moments, those are themes that are ind indicative of his work, and uh, uh, those are the ones I would seek to elaborate upon. Thank okay. You, so I hope uh, the Jogget's performance uh, created a nice atmosphere, also clean up our minds for another part of the conversation. When Marco <coughs> spoke and introduced himself, Zdeniak spoke and introduced himself. Uwe, he didn't spoke much. <laughs> he 
yet. And Petia, she newly joined us. So uh, I would like to ask Petia a few questions. Yeah. Uh, we will borrow the mic from yes. Uwe. OK. Uh, should work. Good. Uh, Petia, let me welcome you in the Chermak Eisenkraft Gallery, where I have uh, the privilege of being a co-owner of this place. And uh, also, I would like to ask you to introduce yourself, because I am meeting you for the first time in my <laughs> life, but I have heard so many interesting and exciting <laughs> stories about you. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I come to art from the perspective of medical science. Mm -hmm. How did I become a medical scientist? First, I studied at university theoretical physics and mathematics. Mm -hmm. And then I come from medical family. I'm the 25th doctor of my family. I studied medicine as well. Mm -hmm. And so with theoretical physics and medical science, one could create very interesting things. So interesting. I came to art because I realized in, I was appointed assistant professor at London University. I was in my 20s and I was given carte blanche to do whatever I like, to investigate. Mm -hmm. My speciality is asthma, mm -hmm. the lungs, problems in the lungs. And that is very closely associated with physics because the air of the lungs determines whether you're asthmatic or you have emphysema or bronchitis or fibrosis, any of this. So, investigating at London University, I came across very interesting things about color, color and sound. And then in the clinic, you realize that color has profound influence on certain illnesses. Certain colors really help certain illnesses. I will stop you in this, uh, in this part, uh, because you are speaking quite uh, in a low, low tone. And I, I'm just checking. Everybody is understanding what Petia is saying. Yes? Can you hear her? Uh, because this, what she just said, is a super important part of all this, what we are doing here. Yeah? So color is uh, strongly connected with some colors are good connected with health and some colors are connected with diseases. Uh, do I understand it correctly? No. no. Uh, art is very important for the state of the human being. Art. Art, in case of color and form, that is painting, in, in, in affects health and well-being depending on how you treat it. I realized that every color has a different quality and colors are alive. They have qualities which heal people. And I have made the list here for your students to send them by email so that they know what color heals what. It's amazing. Thank you. And I will be happy to distribute it. Yes. I also was very interested in symbols and archetypes because symbols and archetypes affect health hugely but it is not understood and not accepted and again I have a long list of symbols and archetypes and explain what each one means the meaning of this is important the bursting sun this is a fantastic picture for example I see it for the first time I know Uwe, Uwe is my student I teach the art of healing and the art of knowing yourself to be a better artist. A new subject, yes, it's coming to be known rather well, but I would like to be anonymous because to be a good teacher, you have to have humility and you have to be willing to serve with joy. And these are two qualities you don't meet very often in, in teachers. Anyway, what do you want to know else? Yeah, that's a good question for me. <laughs> I would like to know everything. <laughs> but, uh, uh, 
Uh, okay. Uh, just a second, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm reforming. <laughs> Transiting. <laughs> okay. Uh, first of all, um, I am so happy, proud, honest to have you here. All of you, by the way. And also, uh, the people who are here come from various areas. Yeah? They are, some of them are uh, graduates, uh, freshly, newly graduates. Some of them are still studying. Uh, some of them come from the business, some of them are teachers, uh, some of them are diplomats and uh, there are other people coming during the whole afternoon who will join us and leave us uh, according to their time's uh, perspectives or, or what is possible for them. And uh, to your question what I would like to know. First, I would like to know because uh, you are more than 85 years old. Yes, and, uh, you thank you for telling more than. <laughs> <laughs> you are amazing, a great looking person. So, uh, I, because uh, we met with your Getsu at Biohacker Summit in Finland, which was, the main topic was how to age with grace. I mean, uh, not to, uh, everybody accepts, I hope here, that we will die once, but uh, the target or the primary primary uh, aim for me is to live the life uh, in the in the positive way when I'm still able to do something as long as possible. If you understand, yeah, that means that uh, uh, I to to stay somewhere locked in the hospital for a for years, uh, uh, trying to uh, recover at when when we are like in your age, that's something what everybody should be, uh, should try not to end uh, in this way. Yeah, so we should live our lives in the way which will keep us alive and active as long as possible. And I believe that uh, there are various techniques, exercise, breathing, uh, food, of course, but also the way how we, well, how we work with stress which I feel is very, very dangerous for all of us. And the impact of art and color for mm -hmm. our lives. Because uh, color is very important uh, for, for me in this, the, let's say, dialogue. Because uh, uh, the paintings from Uwe have very special colors. And I know that uh, the, the, the design and or the selection of the color comes from the knowledge uh, which he get from you mostly, yeah, as far as I know. Also, I would like to introduce uh, Katya. Uh, it's a wife. Uh, she's a wife of Uwe. Uh, she, thanks to her, we have uh, we have Petia here because she brought her she brought her from Vienna. And uh, Katya is also a very interesting person. She's a psychologist and. She comes from India, and uh, uh, she, 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 you were born in India, am no. I right? No? No. Ah, okay. <laughs> I, I missed it. I understood it wrong, I'm sorry. But uh, we met in Germany, and she is a, she is a wife of uh, Uwe. Very nice. And uh, uh, I'm happy to have you here also. But back to the topic. So, uh, you asked me what I would like to know. You already mentioned that you will send us the list of the colors and their meaning, what is super interesting. But uh, let's look at this painting and give us some lecture about it. Oh. This painting has the sun bursting. The sun bursting is very dynamic. It I'm gives you... A microphone. Yeah. I'm afraid that it couldn't uh, catch you correctly. Letter, sorry. Yes. You see, you have soft colors and have energy colors in it. Yellow is predominant, and yellow is the most close color to the sun. It is very dynamic. Yellow is very good for metabolism, for example, in the clinic. Uh, it gives a sense of joy. That's what I could say. There is a lot of joy in this picture. There is a lot of joy of explosion, of dynamism, and also the mauves. When you look at mauve, your creativity gets tickled. Mine does. You also have there 
turquoise, no? Blue and green. That is very healing color. And also calming color. You see the little blues, they come. This is a picture through the yellows and the mauves, which gives me harmony. It's a harmonious picture. It's a happy picture. Bravo, Uwe. <laughs> Uwe, uh, I will give you a microphone now, and you should give your comment about this painting. Yeah? This is... <coughs> I'm sorry, but you have it. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> that is indeed very interesting, because when, uh, while Yugetsu was performing, I got the... Yeah. I heard uh, something in me telling about this painting, and now the whole conversation goes towards this painting. And um, this painting was uh, painted way before the other paintings. It was the most are from 2022, a new period in my life. And um, this was at a turning point of my life. And it was hanging for a long time in my uh, living room at home. Because I enjoyed I it so it. much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a, such an interesting story. You came at a point in my life where I was really was looking, where is it all going to? It was a down point and I was yeah, something had, was already about to change, but I didn't really know. And you came, Mark brought you to, to me. Yeah. Uh, he connected us. Thanks again, Mark. Mm -hmm. And you came there. I didn't know you. He was full of energy and talking about your transition. Mm -hmm. And you wanted to pick up like 10 paintings in your van you brought. I didn't know you before, but something inside said me, okay, let's try this. It, it sounds good. And then we came to this uh, exhibition and you said this picture is already sold, which I'm very grateful for. And it will hang here because, yeah. And I said, okay, why hang it here? Let's put on the new stuff and stuff. But now I see that it's very important to, uh, that it's hanging here because it, yeah, it is, it, I mean, it's one of my favorite paintings. And um, it began also, I met dear friends who met in, who I met on an art residency on Mallorca from Czech. We were just talking about that. They were just here for the opening. And they reminded me of me there in Mallorca having this residency. And I was sitting there, there's a nice pool and you have a view on a valley and in the, the mountainscape in the, in the far away. And I started drawing a landscape and I didn't do that before. So it was a turning point. And I draw like figures coming out of the pool and floating through the valley and over the mountaintops into some transition, yeah, into some other place. And when I came back to Berlin, I started painting this painting. And actually you see there's a different um, frame in the bottom because the painting was much bigger before. I had two figures, um, one little figure, light figure, was like guiding a bigger figure out of this painting, like from this where this is, through the frame, and the frame were like steps. And I called the painting emanation, like something like a birth of a soul. And at some point I realized I don't need these figures anymore. So I cut off the bottom and painted this slightly different. So you can see still there is this transition visible in the, in the color also. And now um, the painting is like this. Also, you, when we went in Berlin, I remember uh, the discussion with you and your wife about yeah. this painting. And, uh, uh, you mentioned something like a like a landscape of our inside, like yeah. uh, inner landscape. Yeah. Yeah. I realized at some point that I'm painting inner landscapes, so not really existing landscapes, but more some that resonate with me and something that comes from subconsciousness. Yes, maybe. I'm very. I like, of course, looking at pictures and art history. They're and called inscapes. It begins yeah. with surrealism. Yeah. And, yes. and I will interrupt you yeah. here because uh, he just mentioned it as usual. And that's the <laughs> word surrealism. 
And uh, that's where many things uh, begin in our culture. But of course, surrealism, it, it continues uh, in many yeah, other ways. Right. But, yeah, uh, Mark, give me, give me your note about this. Well, looking at this painting, as we start from here, I think I should say something about Pitya's view comes, because I'm talking as a historian, that's all, uh, is framed within what's called the psychophysiology of color. It's a beginning, it's a very German preoccupation. It begins with Otto Runger in 1806 to 1809. It's in the Farbenlehre of Goethe in 1811. And the psychophysiological effects of color are first espoused actually by Schopenhauer in a text on visions and color in 1816. And it runs through the 19th century. This is a discourse within German art that is about the psychophysiology of color. There is another tradition, of course, that rejects that. The other tradition is the tradition of physics, which comes from uh, Newton. Newton explains it all through the spectrum and what we would call the mechanical universe. There is another tradition within that scientific method that comes from Chevreul, who explains it all through chemistry. So you have the chemical and the, and the uh, physicist, the mechani mechanistic model, and then this is all challenged in Romanticism. And of course, Romanticism is very important for understanding the work of Uwe. It begins with the Romantic notion that there is a space between effect and affect. Most people, even in English today, don't really know the difference between an effect and an affect. Effect is like wow. Affect is what wow does to you. It's a dichotomy you find within the sublime. If you read the two narratives of the sublime coming from Burke in 1768, he talks about the sublime as, a, as an effect. Wow. And you see this in the paintings of Turner and people like that. Of course, Kant, much more sophisticated thinker, uh, a synthetic thinker, founder of modern synthetic idealism in German thought, saw much more when you look at a Caspar David Friedrich, it's not about the effect, it's about the emotional input it puts into you in the experiencing of the work. So the dichotomy between effect and affect are, are of course, they cannot be separated. They, are, they flow one from another. The effect of something and the affect, the emotional experience that comes with that, are, are embedded. So when looking at color then, you're looking at a very, this tradition, this German physiolo psychophysiological tradition of color has dominated uh, much of uh, the 19th century and emerged in the 20th century in a group called the Blaureiter, particularly in Germany, who were also equally obsessed with color theory. It was then taken up by the Bauhaus, who were also obsessed with color theory. And then it also emerges in the post-war period in the School of Art and Design at Ulm, led by Max Bill, who is the last great movement who theorizes the development of color in terms of the psychologic, psychophysiological affect. I have some sympathy for Pitya's view because although I didn't deal specifically with color in my doctorate, I dealt with the art of the insane and the mentally ill and studied the history of French clinical psychiatry in the 19th century. So I saw how these spontaneous art forms move from being psychopathological into uh, aesthetic acceptance with people like Hans Prinzhorn, Bildner Eiders, Geistler's Crank, and the artistry of the mentally ill in the 1920s. So there's been a very a revolution within this psychophysiological tradition of understanding color in relation to this. So, there's a few thoughts. Does that help? <laughs> yes, it helps a lot. And uh, also, uh, that's a point, uh, a note to all of you, because some of you are artists, uh, photographers, they are, they are also, for sure they are artists here, a lot of them. Uh, but my, my observation is that we still don't know what the color is. We are still thinking about it, and there are various theories. And uh, he has uh, just uh, re some. He provided us a sum up. Just a second. Uh, what is it? Of course, we have our uh, own feeling of color. It has impact. It has uh, a you know, transition effect to all of us, and it has a healing effect, or it it can change a lot. But uh, 
Uh, as color as a bit vibration, of course, has a deep impact on the meaning of the things which we are seeing. So, as I understand, yeah. So, uh, for me, uh, that was one of the reasons I made this workshop. And color, for me, was the main topic of this workshop, yeah. So, people start looking at the things from the perspective of the color definition. So, they understand that some things could help them only uh, from the color perspective, yeah? or they can change them, or they can send some message to their uh, subconsciousness, which is always accept accepted. That's why I am selecting important pieces to the important collections, and I am very, very sensitive about what I'm selling to people, because I know that uh, the impact of the stuff which they are buying is huge, and it can make them a better person, but it can also harm them a lot. So uh, that's very important to understand that art could be a nice, uh, exciting stuff, but it could be dangerous. It could be a weapon. Yeah. And uh, Petia, what is your, your uh, perspective of this thought? This thought is a very interesting one. <clears throat> could you do it next time, please? Thank you. There is a process called interconnectedness. And when I go to Aunt Mary and hear her complain all the time, I feel drained of energy. But equally, if I buy a piece of art which is created in anger or in depression, and I have resonated with it when I was angry or depressed, that piece of art would always fortify either my depression or my anger. So that piece of art to interconnectedness will act on me all the time. I speak from the perspective of a medical scientist. Medicine is what I know, and Newton science is what I know about color. Now, when I look at the interconnectedness, I see how Color affects the psychology and the physiology. First, the physiology. You have a piece of art there. It's a nice piece of art. It shines. When bright color hits the brain, the brain sends in motion electrical signals which produce hormones like meta meta melatonin. 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 But first, serotonin. Serotonin is the pre precursor of melatonin. Melatonin controls the rhythms in the body. So when you have nice bright weather, we are happy. Serotonin comes. When you have the weather of November, December, January, February, when times are gray, we feel lethargic. We feel tired. Why? because of the difference in production in melatonin. And that could be helped truly by artists like Uwe with his brilliant colors. The brilliant color brings in the brain, yes, I'm happy today, instead of uh, another day, uh, it's raining again. <laughs> this is where I come from. Mm -hmm. I don't know any of the theories which, which Max says, but I am not influenced. My understanding of color is only in respect to how it affects human beings and how it affects illnesses. So I could mm. tell you against cold feet, you give red because red stimulates. Mm. If you're very excited... But this is what Schopenhauer writes in 1816. I have not read Schopenhauer, <laughs> but I, my experience is very practical from the clinic. Mm. It is not from books. What I tell you is verified, verified, verified and could be verified every time. Mm -hmm. Mark? So. Mark well, the notion of color, I should say, historically, everyone thinks we've always loved color. It isn't true. We know now, as we're discovering rather a shock for art history, that all this sculpture that we see as white marble and classical sculpture from the period of Greece and Rome uh, was all painted originally. It merely has lost its color. Within ultra, ultraviolet lighting, now we can see they were 
far more garish and vulgar. It rather shocks the classical mind to think of these great sculptures being brightly coloured, polychromed, as it were. So uh, it had a positive aspect in antiquity. Then it, colour went through a very negative phase, uh, particularly in the Middle Ages, not so much in illuminations, but through to someone like John Locke. You see, one of the problems of colour is it is, a, he said, I'm not saying it's true, I'm saying he said it is a secondary quality. Why is it a secondary quality? Because it's dependent on light. If you turn all the lights off, the world goes black. If you turn lights up very high, the world goes white. So the, quality, the notion, notion of colour itself is always mutually, um, as it were, mediated through lighting. You just expressed that. You said in the, if it's a bright summer's day, you feel good because it's mediated through light. If it's a dark, somber winter's day, you don't feel so good. It's mediated through light. So regardless of which colour one's specifically referring to, there is always, and this was in England particularly bad because of John Locke, is so the founder of modern empiricism, hence the whole tradition of modern science comes out of this empirical model, so-called empirical model, and it had this negative connotation. In fact, a friend of mine who's very keen on colour, called David Batchelor, wrote a book called Chromophobia that yeah, came out, came out uh, 20 years ago, as it were, in defence of this rather negative view of colour being attached. And this idea lives on because uh, if you look at Donald Judd's sculpture, you look at minimalism, frequently a critique says, oh, well, the colour is just a skin. Because if you turn the light off, the volume, the mass, the weight doesn't change of an object, but of course, perception of the object changes. But shall I tell you yeah. a physiological fact? Sorry? Physiological. Well, I, sir, I said the psychophysiological tradition begins in the 19th century. No, no. Yes. Listen to this one. If you have your ugly art pro the piece of whatever there, and you switch off the light, yeah. that affects you through the vibrations color emits mm. at night when you're asleep. Mm. So the depression will last you while you're asleep because the color affects you all the time when you're awake and when you're asleep. There is vibration in color like sound. The sounds of color. The ancients of the East, they put in different areas of the torso, different colors. This is your red, and then orange, and then the green, and then pale blue, and then deep blue, and then mauve. Now, this is true in the laboratory. In these areas, what they have said is true. I want you to understand that if you produce a negative piece of art, that would affect people negatively at night and during the day because of the vibration of color. It touches the skin. And why is it so? <laughs> In the womb, when the fetus develops, the brain and the skin are developed from the same cell. Therefore, we could say that the skin is the first layer of the brain. Therefore, massage helps psychologically people. Mm -hmm. Body work, so to speak, massage, osteopathy, when you use this, you're affecting the psychology of people. And those who, who are massages could tell you that they sometimes experience a lot of cries and difficult outbursts in people who are massaged because they touch on something inside them. So the touch of the vibration of color acts also without light. Mm -hmm. uh, Zdenik, now you wanted to uh, say something about this. Já jsem jenom chtěl poznamenat, že můžu k tomu do tomu tématu hovořit pouze z vlastní zkušenosti životní. He just pointed that he can speak only from his life experience. Zažil jsem stavy, které zažívám průběžně, ale bylo intenzivní období, když jsem se tomu vyzvěnoval, že jsem intenzivně viděl vibrace, energii. A cítím ji do, do teďka a vidím, ale podle toho, jak se na to zaměří. 
So he has, uh, during his uh, physical transformation, as we could say, or transition, uh, he observed that he has a new ability of seeing vibrations. And uh, when he gets concentrated or focused on this uh, uh, ability, he still can see vibrations from Zvětsí's uh, operation, from everything, yes? Uh, můžete jenom přirovnat něčemu, když jste s někým a najednou vám jakoby s ním není dobře, vlastně ty vaše vibrace nejsou kompatibilní. So it's comparable to the situation or moment when you are uh, in, a, in some group or with someone who you don't like. And uh, that means your vibrations doesn't, uh, uh, it are not in harmony with the uh, vibrations of the other person. Že z mý zkušenosti, co uh, cítím, když to tak řeknu, co, co, co cítím, a, a, a tak můžu vlastně jenom říct, že, nebo co jsem pochopil za tu dobu, za těch 15 let toho mýho vývoje, v těch dalších dimenzích toho vnímání naší reality, je, že jednak každý z nás podle úrovni svých vlastní vibrace nebo svého úrovni, úrovni svého vědomí vnímá ten svět, ten univerz okolo něj úplně jinak. Well, the, this is a very strong topic, which, which he just mentioned. So, uh, of course, I understand because I passed it through. But some, for some people, this could be this could be like a, a, just a witch, or uh, somebody they could burn you on the on the stake on the stake. Yeah. So, uh, so yes, he believes, and I must agree uh, with him that uh, we as a persons are vibrating according to the level of our own development. So there are people with lower vibrations and people with higher vibrations. And uh, uh, also uh, this, uh, this uh, is something what cannot be proven now by science uh, openly, but we know that a lot of scientists, especially in Switzerland in certain, are doing research exactly about this and they will be able to prove this statement his statement very soon on the on the physicist level so as as they as they uh, as, as i wrote in one uh, one um, article in nature magazine but uh, uh, Zdeniek, uh, his point was that uh, this kind of vibrations differ and uh, we should, we should, uh, he is aware of it, yeah? Uh, pochopil jsem za tu dobu, že vlastně všechno je energie. Yes, uh, he just mentioned yeah, that everything is the, the energy, everything is the vibration. Mm -hmm. To znamená, jak barva, předmět, tak uh, cokoliv okolo nás, nás nějakým způsobem ovlivňuje. Yes, I 100% agree. Everything what is surrounding us has an impact on us. To znamená, že může být zasnuto a ono to stejně funguje. So he agrees with Petia that no matter if we have light or we don't have light, if when the light is turned off, the vibrations are still happening. May I quote something else? Excuse me. I had as a student a blind man, blind psychologist. And his response to color was identical to that of the people who could see. Because of this very fact, color affects, has an effect on the skin through the vibration it emits. Color emits vibrations, like sound. And I suppose he didn't need light. Well, color is light, but 40 octaves down. Yes, of course, I agree. Yeah, I agree. But I also should defend Mark, because what Mark said as a as a scientist, scholar, and he just uh, point out that according to the theories we have, actually, we have this kind of uh, uh, ex explanation, interpretation mm -hmm. from the Western perspective of view. Also, we have Eastern perspective of view, which is deeply encoded in the religion, in, Absolutely. The, in the society, and this, <coughs> this is a different story, uh, which 100% uh, confirms what you said, and what to use that. <laughs> so uh, we have not a kind of conflict, but we have a kind of uh, meeting between Eastern and Western, uh, not only philosophy, psychology, perspective, 
And uh, I'm so happy that this dialogue is happening right now and that you can hear it, yeah? I know everything what they mentioned and I'm super happy to hear that. Uh, but uh, for many of you, this could be something new, enriching, and also it could change a little bit your perspective uh, of view on many things, especially on uh, the, your lifestyle. So, uh, yes, stay in, but you didn't finish it. Um, transformers. Yes, we are speaking about transformation. Uh, <coughs> Vlastně jakoby důsledek toho týmní proměny je, že jsem uh, měl v sobě vždycky uh, takový ten, to, že jsem viděl tam někde, že tam někde něco je. A v rámci těch 15 let, co jsem nežil v té většinové společnosti, tak jsem vlastně měl stavy, že jsem byl schopný to cítit a i zažít fyzické projevy. OK. So, uh... During his uh, transformation of uh, 15 years spent in the forest, he understood that there is something above or something m more than we could see, something what is uh, uh, the energies which cannot be seen but could be felt. And uh, that's, that's the reason uh, or that's uh, how he transformed during uh, this time and this uh, this uh, transition which he passed and also it changed his perspective to his life. Yeah. A to má samozřejmě spojitosti s tvorbou asi všech umělců a uvěho a uměl. And it, this, this knowledge has a deep impact on his, uh, on his work and on, on the art which he produces. And uh, you, you could see that uh, the photographs from Zdeněk are, we could see, painted by light. And mm -hmm. he's working with that. And uh, when you look at the Uwe works, which are surrounding us, they are full of colors, which uh, uh, the, the, sometimes the color doesn't match with the content. And th that's what is interesting. We should ask the question, why is this painted in this color? And uh, I wanted to make this uh, workshop for you to understand why, yeah? And to understand the reasons. And uh, when you get this key, you get the, the you get the key to read his paintings, and it's like I when I always when I speak about art but for the, me it's like the book. This comes straight out of German thinking, as I say. You know, when Franz Marc was asked why he painted his horses blue, he said horses are blue in my head. Yeah, yeah. You know, in a certain sense, color is conceptual as well as effective. Yes, yes. It has it is of the mind as it is of the eye. And so it has those two sides. The one thing Pitya did say that are, is problematic to me, and only in that she talked about color, we, we, there is a danger of overprivileging color. By, the, uh, by your description of uh, art, uh, this bad art or ugly art, we would have to empty half the museums of the modern world yeah. because a lot of art today is deliberately ugly and intended to be ugly and, and transgressive and, and political and so uh, and a and. lot of energy going to museums watching these things. Yeah. I've been to the British Museum to the mummies. I had yeah. to lie for three days afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's true. Yeah. But ugly art is, has its own theory and history. Or There's even an art movement begun by Marcia Tucker called the bad art movement. And yeah. some of the leading artists of the painters of the world are so-called bad painters. No, they're not bad. No, they're no not yeah, it's a euphemism. Yeah. So quiet. <laughs> because uh, no painter is yeah, bad. Yeah, it, it, we should it, look it, at the reason why yeah. something happened. Yeah, The bad paintings happened because they could do it. And because they could, they could do it, they yes. could do it. And that was the reason. They just declared that they have the freedom of speech and that they have the freedom to do anything what they want. Yeah. And they just missed the Zeitgeist exhibition. Yes. Unfortunately, they were just too young to be in the Zeitgeist exhibition. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and it wasn't possible before, so yeah, that's, that's important. Is that it? I just wanted to say something that is very important to me. That's just it. A zase mluvím za sebe, nemůžu za sebe nikoho jiného. A měl jsem to už od malička, když jsem něco tvořil a najednou, a to znáte u těch dětí, že oni najednou jsou do toho zabraní, jsou úplně takový jako v tom, v tom flow a najednou ty nápady a blbosti z nich padají, jsou úplně šťastní. A vlastně při té tvorbě já to mám tak, že 
já tam cítím jako nějaký silný napojení. Můžete tomu říkat jako inspirace, můžete tomu říkat cokoliv jiného, ale já čer, cítím, že jsem napojený na nějaký jako globální vědomí nebo na něco, z čeho čerpám tu inspiraci, stane se ze mě taková anténa, ale jednou jsem prostě v tom flow a ty věci prostě ze mě padají. A já nevím, proč to tak dělá. Prostě to jde samo, takhle. Dobra. I'm sorry, I just forgot to translate. <laughs> Naopak jste říkal, že to je? Že to je nápad. Nápad, to je nápad, ale vlastně jste mi nutnul důležitý téma, že vlastně on je to naopak, že to, co vy vytvoříte, ovlivňuje vlastně ten svět okolo vás a vlastně potom si taháte ty věci i zpátky, jo. A... Uh, just a second. Jo, promiň, uh, to jsem byl. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think uh, what, we, what we should translate was just the last sentence. We, he mentioned something what is very interesting. Mark, I know you will have some your comments about it. He just said that What you create has the impact on your uh, surroundings, on the audience, and mm-hmm. it has the impact back on you. So it creates a kind of circle, yeah? And it's the same also, not, we don't need to speak only about art. We can speak about everything what we do, yeah? So uh, the way how we act, it, it goes there and back again, mm-hmm. yeah? So uh, it, all these, uh, uh, all these, Things which were described has many representations in many parts of our life, and we just did, hit or touched something interesting. And uh, Mark, you, your comment about this? Well, you know, people, you, students used to ask me, "What is, you know, what is art? What a question! What is art?" And I would say, "Art is many things. It's like an umbrella." I chose to say to my students, "There are five areas of art." There is the maker, i.e. the human being who makes the thing, and they're pretty complex, human beings are pretty complicated creatures, so you can spend a lot of time in that area. There is the material means, you know, you couldn't put a uh, Richard Serra on a glass table, it would go through the table and through the floor. Uh, So there are limits to materials, there's only so much you can do with paint, there's only so much you can do with photography. There are limits to all materials. There is the thing made, I don't even call it the work of art, because it's the thing realized, Uwe has realized something here, and then it takes its meaning of art usually at the point of reception. I could tell you I'm the greatest painter that ever lived, but I just do it all alone up in the attic, and I go up there every night and I paint away, You, but I wouldn't be an artist because reception, presenting the work to the world, is part of the process. Uh, of the, and then the, the fifth area, I would say, is the area of what we call historiography. You can never see this work again for a first time. You saw it today. If you see it in six months in another place, you'll be in a different space. The work will be in a different space. So there is the history of the history of the work. And this is an, another, and this, I suppose, is what we call art, this huge umbrella that encompasses every aspect of life. And in looking at the work, you have to also realize, as I would say to my students, remember it's reading you as much as you're reading it. So it's self-revealing. It tells you what you're preoccupied with. So if you look at the same painting as I used to send my students to look at Uh, Titian or Tiziano's Bacchus and Ariadne at the National Gallery for many years I would make them go back for every year and write down I had a series of questions they would write them down and every year they came back with different answers well obviously the painting hadn't changed but they had changed so it reads the viewer as much as the viewer reads the work so it's a reciprocal if it were not so art objects would just be museum dead objects they'd just be dead, they would have no living force. And the living force of art is this interactive reading and engagement. Does that make sense? Yeah, for me 100%. How about our audience? Uh, do you have any comments on what we just said? Because now, last few minutes were super intense. <laughs> <laughs> may, I, may I have a question? Mm. I would like to ask, because you mentioned that you observe all things from many different So question to Petia. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In many perspective, uh, what is a good art and bad art? So good art and bad art. Good art and bad art. Ah, good art. Oh. From medical perspective. From medical perspective. Good art is the art of beauty. It inspires. It brings the spirit up. It makes you feel 
I'm okay. That is good art. Bad art, if it, it makes you depressed, if it leaks your energy because it's yuck. <laughs> it's yuck. Some art is yuck. And, and I, I have to do, admit it. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. There is one problem. Because she is uh, super experienced, super sensitive. But there are many people, most of the society, who are not aware of this, what she just said. Yeah who are not sensitive enough to feel it uh, constantly, yeah? And so it may happen that you put something on your wall and after a few years you become super ill and you are trying to find the reason, where is it, yeah? And it couldn't be, it, it might be somewhere else, yeah? It, it might, the reason might be not inside of you, yeah? So uh, this is something what I am uh, deeply, deeply aware of. And uh, something what, as a gallerist, I am trying to help to, to, let's say, get rid of the shit stuff and to live, to give, to give the opportunity to the art which deserves it, to shine for the people who should see that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that's the answer to your question, I would say. Yeah. But nevertheless, when you're sensitive, it doesn't matter if, you, if you're sensitive or not. If you're exposed to art which is created in anger or in depression, in that art there is the anger and depression. The artist is not bad, it's just produced this anger there. If you at some moment resonate with this art and buy it and put it in your environment, you will not only pay with your money, but your, with your vital energy every day. This is what I mean. And vital energy now is measurable. Uh, everything I'm saying is measurable. Collectors are listening. Yeah? <laughs> Important. <laughs> Sorry? Yes, I just said that the collectors of art should now really listen because I agree. Yeah. And uh, I don't think the, that we need to have the light on the piece of art to have the feeling, to feel the energy, the vibration which comes from it. I agree with uh, Petty, I agree with Zdeněk. Uh, of course, I don't agree with the theories which, uh, which Mark mentioned, but he is aware of other uh, theories which mm. are uh, confirming this. Yeah? Well, uh, yes? Well, I didn't write, in the, I wrote about wonder in the catalogue. Yes, yeah, yes. just a second. Leon, you have a question. Yeah? You, no, give your question. I will remember that wonder. We should, we should go back to wonder, because wonder for me is something magical. <laughs> <laughs> deep and incredible ideas uh, about uh, color and objects being impactful even if it's in the darkness and nobody can see it. Uh, the fact that it, the art or objects radiate energy, positive, negative, very interesting. We make glass, sculptures, objects. Yeah, when Leon Yakimich speaks about we, he speaks about the company which is called Laslit and <laughs> they they Lask. produce... Uh, Laska Svit means yes. love, light, love yes. light. Yes, Laska the name of the company means the love of light. Laska Svit, which of course Laska Svit. Nice yeah. name. They mm -hmm. produce the chandelier, which, which is at the entrance. Yeah. Yeah. Many others. Many, many others. Uh, but this one is super small because they are, what they are doing, they are the biggest uh, lightning sculptures in the world. Thank you. Uh, and I always say, uh, glass without light is, is dead. And uh, that Glass, in a way, is a tangible, is a light made tangible. Because architects love to work with light, but it's an abstract concept, but that's why they use so much glass. So what I learned today is quite shocking or interesting, actually. Uh, glass doesn't have to have light and still have an impact, which is interesting. Yes. And uh, every company wants to understand why they exist. That what they do has some deeper meaning. So the why, the question why, which is, so it also of professions as the mission of the company. Right? There's a vision which is where the company is going, and the mission is why it exists. Yes. So our why has always been lifting everyone, to uplift people. That's his primary target too. Yeah. But uh, what, I'm and his also. what I'm learning now, and I've started to think about it even earlier, it's not the product itself, it's the process behind yeah. creating yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, the so energy which is there. So yeah. When the craftsman was really upset, yes. <coughs> and maybe it's not going to lift anyone, anyone, even if it's yeah. a beautiful glass, piece of glass, or a tableware or something. 
Yeah, yeah, by the way, this yeah. is very, very particular moment which you mentioned because we are nearly sure that this is happening uh, with painting, sculptures, and the, the pieces where there is a direct touch of the artist. Yeah, but uh, when we speak about glass, uh, glass is very special because when they make it, uh, they there is a lot of energy because the glass is in the fluid yeah. form. It's yeah. an amorphic material, neither liquid so, nor solid. So it is liquid in the time. And uh, the question is, uh, how it, how strong is the impact of the creator or, or inside? But of course, the, the form, the shape, it matters, I would say. I am sure. Or uh, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. By the way, I'm not sure about the form. Shape but matters. The last yeah. one, actually, I realized we are not lifting around, we are lifting ourselves. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It makes us happy. Yes. And hopefully, it transcends. To, the, to everyone, if it's done in a positive way. So I'm thinking how to review our mission now, mission statement. Sorry? Lifting our microphone. And you have to comment on this. Yeah. Welcome. Same, yeah, I think the same goes for doctors. Right? Yes. It's not they are saving the people, they are saving ourselves, they themselves, maybe yes. by, by helping people. When you love your patients, yeah. you do them a lot of good. Right? Yes. I've loved everybody I have met. I don't like people because of my personality. But when it comes to serving as a doctor, I love everybody. It doesn't matter. Poor, rich, black, white, green. It's the same. Yeah, especially the that's green people, they deserve love. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, I've seen. Uh, you don't know what she has seen. Yeah. Of course, I'm just kidding. Uh, Uwe, give me your thoughts about this, because you are very silent. Yeah, I was just listening and I just agree to a lot of points, um, especially that being of color, of course, light brings up the color. But mm. I think I could feel if I, you put me in a blue room or in a red room without light, I would could say after it, it would be a nice experiment what color it was. So I, I can really, I'm a very sensitive person and I spent my, yeah, sadly 20 years of my life in Berlin in an art society where I was always thinking I'm so in the wrong place, but I didn't realize it. And I was going to these galleries and feeling yeah. what is going on? What are these people doing? What are they projecting in the art pieces? What are they, what do they want? There's all this ego into these forms and just projecting it out. And I was so sad all the time and I'm so happy that I moved out of it. And um, it's my own, of course, my own transition. And um, my aim was always just, yeah, that was not what I signed up for. I wanted to do something that makes people happy. And, and I realized I have a, really a feeling for color. I'm very intuitive. I could not tell so much about why I use the colors, but I learned a lot th through Pitya. What is these colors for? And I see at the colors and see, okay, yeah, that makes sense, totally. But I'm so intuitive that I just do it mostly. And then, um, yeah, yeah, I wanted to say something. Yes. Uh, Mark? Well, just an observation, of course, you know, in Jane Eyre and in a lot of literature of the 19th century, the Red Room is often used as a metaphor for disturbance. Yeah. And so, you know, one, no one denies this sort of environmental uh, aspect of colour. I chose to talk about wonder in the essay for two reasons. Uh, first of all, it predates the sublime, and Pitya referred, she used the word beauty, she didn't use the word sublime, because the sublime is often ugly. The sublime is a concept begun by Cassius Longinus in the fourth century, maybe the first century, we don't know, it's still debated. We don't even know if he wrote the book. But uh, the sublime emerges with Immanuel Kant in the 19th century. Before that, uh, the principle of, uh, of color was usually linked to the idea of wonder. Now, wonder as a concept is the first principle of philosophy. Plato says the first principle of philosophy is to wonder. I wonder why. And philosophy has been shaped over two and a half thousand years, Western philosophy, Eastern thought is something else, by two questions. What is it to know? And what is it to be? Um, one is called the epistemological question, the other is called the ontological question. Being is a phenomenon of the 19th century, largely revived by Kierkegaard, going back to Plato and runs through, through Nietzsche and Schopenhauer and right up into the twin, to modern Husserl and Heidegger and so on. 
But the, you know, the old principle of wonder uh, begins with Plato, and it's also the very first one of the first sentences of one of the epigra uh, the um, aphorisms within the Meditations by Car uh, Descartes, the founder of modern philosophy, is first one must begin with wonder. I wonder why. And so color is very linked to wonder because when children look at color, they have this immediate response uh, because the effect and the affect are closely linked together in childhood. Uh, as we get older, we reflect on why red may have this effect or blue might have this effect and so on. But children respond with the immediacy of wonder. And of course, the most common uh, aspect of wonder is the rainbow and of course the history of the rainbow is an in, a profoundly influential thing for children it seems miraculous for children it seems for some adults it still seems miraculous mm -hmm. <laughs> the wonder of the rainbow so wonder is why I began with uh, this theme uh, and uh, I'm sure the children who will come to this show, if any do come to the show, My daughter, yes, will respond to the work through this, uh, this effect of wonder, rather than uh, uh, the uh, s sublime traditions which are also to do with uh, awe, dark thoughts. You know. Remember some of the famous sublime images like, are of avalanches, are of horrors of destruction, painted beautifully in colour by... <laughs> Turner, but there are, so ugliness can be presented deceitfully through color as well, uh, and so this uh, the, it's a much it's a very complex area the issue of color. Yeah. Uh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. No, this gentleman wants to ask. Uh, Thomas, give me a second. Don't forget. Uh, Etia, what is your thought when uh, Mar just mentioned that ugly things could be painted nicely? What do you think about it? What is important? The mood of the artist when he is painting ugly stuff in nice color, yeah, or the content itself, or the color. What has the impact on us? All three. All three, yeah. All three. To be honest, yes. Yes. So when we have terrible content painted nicely, the, the impact it will be terrible. Yes? Yes, you would leak your energy. I talk about energy because I could measure it. Okay. I could reproduce it and tell you that's the fact. Okay. You leak your energy when you're in front of something ugly, sculpture, picture, whatever. Yeah, because something what is ugly to us could be nice for somebody else. Yeah. yeah. And also uh, different culture. Yeah. What, uh, sometimes I don't understand what uh, Japanese people uh, call nice. Yeah, and uh, we have one Japanese monk here. He should speak about it. Yeah. Uh, so this is something what uh, sh it's not easy to describe it to common people to understand it. Yeah. Of course, those of uh, the observers who are able to work with themselves for them is very easy. They simply look at the stuff and they ask their body what resonation does it have? Is it good for me or it is not good for me? Yeah. You don't have to ask the question. Just observe yourself. Exactly. Am I leaking energy? Am I gaining energy? Listen, this is important. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. You should, when you look at art, you should also speak to yourself. What impact does it have on you? No matter the content. Yeah. Yes. Uh, sorry. Uh, Thomas, do. Just, Thomas, please. Thank you. Uh, no, my question was similar to yours, Tomas, so uh, maybe just to put it in a similar way, differently. If I, imagine, if I imagine a picture like this, which is super positive, with all the colors, all the beauties, the composition, topic, everything is super nice. But I can imagine Uwe maybe uh, did it when he was, it's not probably true, he was totally depressed, he was full of ang anger, he was like really down, and after he tried to paint this to, to get better, and he failed. He was even worse after it. But then, we move the picture somewhere, and people see the wonderful colors, the wonderful positive composition. But uh, you argue that we would probably feel this kind of bad vibration, he put it in there. But what would be then 
the, the carrier of this bad vibration because the vibration of the color is nice. The composition is it nice. Is, it is where the, does it come from? Then, it is the bad? vibration from the piece he cut. Okay. You have not seen the vibration when he cut it. That piece, he is sensitive enough to cut mm -hmm. because he's left a nice picture, which doesn't leak my energy. The others would leak my energy. So this relies, I mean, all I'm just describing are models. I used to say to my master's student, find the horse for the course. You don't want uh, a marathon runner doing the 100 meters and you don't want a 100 meters runner doing the marathon. You find the method to deal with the work. Obviously, if you're dealing with abstract informal painting, you'd find phenomenology much more useful to you than semiotics. So it's finding the horse for the course. But Pitchers also is relying on a particular tradition of thought, which is called vitalism. In Bergson, it's called the Elan Vital. It presupposes that a work, there are two ways you could look at art like this. The passage journey I talked about in the beginning could be seen as a journey to transcendence. We began with transition, passage, or it can be seen as imminence. I take Pitya's argument to be one of imminence. It comes from the imminent presence within the work, which is a Kantian idea. It comes from the intuition, in philosophy, and Immanuel Kant, of course, is the man who wrote about beauty and the sublime, probably the most important philosopher of the last 200 years, certainly, as regard art and aesthetics. Remember, he bring, although aesthetics as a word is reinvented in the 18th century by Baumgartner and Mendelssohn, uh, it is actually Kant, and more importantly, afterwards, Hegel's lectures on aesthetics. The word existed in Greek, but it didn't have a, a philosophical meaning, it just meant emotional effects. It only took its philosophical categories in uh, the philosophy of the late 18th and 19th century. So this is why I called my, the aesthetics of wonder. It's a notion that uh, wonder has these affects. But there is this theme of intuition and immanence, which as I say is Kantian. There are reductionist biologist thinkers at London University, at my old university college where I was a professor at the Slade, who would say, you know, there's, this is no such thing. It's just, you know, our brain is just a complicated chemistry box that we don't understand as yet. That's a biologist talking. Well, the biological, yes, absolutely. Yes. They are re what are called reductionists. And they reduce the whole of thinking. They even deny the concept of consciousness. You know, there are areas, I, I have a man who gave a whole series of lectures called Ramachandran, who was a very famous cognitive scientist who's reinvestigating re themes of synesthesia, which is also a very important aspect within medical science. Synesthesia is the idea that you can transfer from one sense to another sense an experience. It becomes very important in the beginning of modern abstraction. Kandinsky uh, particularly uh, came out of theosophy, as did um, Mondrian, and they thought that um, this idea of synesthesia, you could hear the, the color red in sound, or you could, uh, uh, in Kandinsky's case, a lot of these, <laughs> Kandinsky thought he'd be a better musician, that's why he called his works impromptus or improvisations. But he's uh, thinking about the beginning of abstract art. Yes. Yeah, he's talking about it right now. And, Sch and uh, uh, of course, Schoenberg thought he'd be a better painter than musician. Uh, because he was also a painter. Both of them were painters and musicians. Now we think Kandinsky is the better painter and Schoenberg's the better and musician. We still don't speak about their experiments with spiritism. We don't. Speak well, no, about... theosophy is a very, you know, in the I late mean... 19th century, you had the emergence of modern psychology, what we now call dynamic psychology, dynamic psychology. You know, there's either the psychiatry. Remember the word psychiatry was only invented in the 1890s. Before that, it was called alienism. And it's a very modern psychiatry. And you had the clinicians. You had Kreppelin and the tradition of the clinicians who were, tended to be determinists. And then you had the advent of people like Freud. And then you had people in between, like Pierre Janet, uh, writing in 1889, L'Automatisme Psychologique in between the two. 
And at that time, the boundary between psychical research, what we now call parapsychology, and psychology or psychoanalysis as it emerged with Freud and Jung and Adler and all the others that flow on from the psychologistic tradition. I will interrupt you more. Uh, just to sum up this part of the workshop, because uh, I know how difficult it is to concentrate ourselves for such a strong topics, especially in his British English. And uh, uh, when uh, we should all have a break now, because uh, we need to breathe a little bit to eat something, drink something, and uh, Yogetsu will play us another part of his uh, of his performance. And just to just to just to point some some notes which I made during uh, your topics or uh, your speeches. Uh, first, when we speak about anything what is important, what matters in art, you can see that philosophers were thinking about it. And that many things which we are feeling, thinking about, were perfectly described, and this guy is able to give you the overview that, yes, this happened in that time, this guy observed it, and he described it for the others. And uh, this is important for me. Somebody described it for the others. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, Petia, she also is doing something what she spent more than 85 years in this in her life here and there is a large uh, knowledge which she, which she get from her own experience which she is now passing to all of us and what I remember from from this part of workshop that every piece of art has its own energy that Color matters, shape matters, but also uh, us as the observers matters because we are vibrating together with the stuff we are looking for. Looking Resonate. Yes. Resonate. Resonate. Yes. Sorry. Thank you very much. So uh, this is this is important. Let's say sum up from this part of the workshop. And uh, later I would be very happy to go a little bit bit back to the color again. And we will go through the show, so we can speak about various pieces and we can talk about it. Yes? Is it okay for you? Yeah? So, uh, let's take a break. Uh, I'll give you five minutes, then Yogetsu, and then we continue. Okay?